If you live in Texas and uh, you ever heard the phrase Comanche moon, um, the reason a summer moon is often called Comanche moon is because back when the Comanches were at large uh, in the West, um, they performed so many night raids in Texas under a summer moon that people nicknamed summer moons Comanche moon. Empire of the Summer Moon, Quanah Parker and the Rise and Fall of the Comanches, the most powerful Indian tribe in American history, is written by S.C. Gwen, and ladies and gentlemen, never have I ever read a book that has better illustrated the fact that history is not black and white, but a thousand shades of gray. This is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, I have a running list of books that uh, I will have my children read uh, as like an incentive for them to, for me to buy them a car or something. Um, you know, basically I, I have a running list of books that I just think would be very beneficial for my children to read one day, whenever I have children, hopefully when I have children. And this is gonna be on that list of books that they need to read if they want any help from me um, with regards to, you know, like a car or something like that. Um, because this, this book, I mean, I've never read a book that has made me look around at my environment and go, what happened here? Because I live in Oklahoma and the Comanche tribe, their, basically their reach was, let's see if I can find the map. Their reach was this much of land, basically. So they basically had most of Texas, they controlled most of, most pretty much all of Oklahoma, uh, part of New Mexico, Colorado, and Kansas. That was their reach, the Comanche, basically, empire. And so much stuff that unless you've read this book or if you've read other Native American history, so much history happened in this land that so most people are totally ignorant of. And this book just took the, the, the covers off of all of it for me. And I just, I look around and I'm like, I mean, it's, it's the most insane history ever. Um, I mean, I was introduced to this book through the Joe Rogan podcast. He inter Joe Rogan interviewed the uh, the author, and I was like, "Man, I got to read that book." And that interview is great, but you don't get how crazy things, how wild the Wild West really was until you've read a book like this. Um, the big takeaway I got from the book is that history. I mean, it holds very, there are very few good people in history. There's mostly just a bunch of bad people. You know how like, uh, you know, you know how people used to say, call Indian savages and everything? No, here's the truth. Most people, regardless of race, were savages in some way. You look at this history, you look at the history of the Texas Rangers who in large part were born because of the Comanche tribe. You look at the history of the Comanches. It's, there's so much like actual, like barbaric savagery on both sides. I have never read like a book that just makes me go, oh my gosh, all these Wild West, the most violent Wild West movie I've ever seen doesn't even compare to something like this. The only book I think I've read that compares with regards to the darkness and the violence is probably Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, which I've reviewed on this channel. That decently encapsulates just how freaking crazy the Wild West was. But ladies and gentlemen, I just gotta say, you need to read this book. There are a number of passages I wanna read to you, um, but first, I, I just gotta talk like the Comanches themselves, the Comanche tribe, uh, what I really appreciate about the author of this book is he did not pull punches. He acknowledged the good aspects of the Comanche tribe, and he also acknowledged the actual, just straight up evil that, the, that was common practice among the Comanches. Like, um, to illustrate both the good and the bad, uh, 
we, we really only have to look, you just have to look at like one family. So a famous family in Texas was the Parker family. Uh, and famously, the Parker clan was basically mostly annihilated. And there were several uh, kids that were on the at Parker's Fort in uh, Texas, which was basically along kind of the border of uh, what is, I believe it was the 98th Meridian in Texas. And uh, it was kind of almost like once you go past there, you're in Comanche land and you are probably going to get killed. <laughs> um, they had this fort there and basically towards the beginning of the book, this history is recounted. Parker's Fort was attacked by uh, a band of Comanches and um, many people were killed and uh, a couple of people were taken captive. Uh, there's two that I really want to talk about that uh, really uh, bear a lot of weight to this conversation. Uh, Rachel Parker, who I believe was, I don't know, was she 17? I don't know, she was young, but she wasn't super young. She was basically a young adult. And then there was Cynthia Ann Parker, who was nine years old when she was kidnapped. And I just want to illustrate the difference here. So. Cynthia Ann Parker, and this is one of the most interesting parts of the book, also very sad. Cynthia Ann Parker, she was kidnapped and she was assimilated into the Comanche tribe when she was nine years old. And for 24 years, she lived with the Comanches. And there were times during that uh, period where she could have been ransomed out of the tribe, but she said no. She did not want to go back to white man civilization. Even though she was a white woman, she wanted to stay with the Comanches. She found their way of life fulfilling and magical, and she loved it. Like, she became a Comanche pretty much full blown. Uh, and as you read in the book, she obviously, uh, well, eventually she gets recaptured into white civilization. Her husband, who she had married, with the, in the Comanches, he and their band basically got wiped out and Cynthia Ann got kidnapped back into white man's civilization. And the whole, every time, and you just see like, there was something that the Comanches had that was beautiful. Just all they did, they just hunted and they celebrated their hunts at night and they did the same thing over and over and over again. It was, they lived a wild nomadic lifestyle and there was something there that was not in, uh, white man civilization and Cynthia Ann Parker missed that so much when she was recaptured in white civilization that for the rest of her life, all she thought about was trying to go back and have somebody take her back to be with the Comanches. Uh, not only because she wanted to go back there, but also because her two sons were, who were, her two sons were still out there. One of whom was Quanah Parker, who is the uh, last tribe of the, uh, last chief of the Comanches, fascinating son of a white woman and uh, a Comanche Indian, and he ends up basically being the, the, final, uh, the final chief of the Comanches. That's a whole other part that we'll get into. But you see, like, Cynthia Ann Parker saw the good side of the Comanches, and there was real beauty there. And it was just, it was so tragic. I don't want to spoil necessarily what happens to her in white man civilization, but it's sad and it's horrible. And it goes to show that there was just as many horrible people on the, you know, white settler front as there were on the uh, Indian uh, tribal fronts. I mean, what happened to Cynthia Ann Parker, it was basically, I mean, she was just, it's horrible. I don't want to go into it. The it, That part, kind of the end of Cynthia Ann Parker's uh, story, it made me cry. I cried for a while. It was just so tragic. And even like people that knew Cynthia Ann said that uh, white, man, white people did worse to her than the Comanches ever did by kidnapping her in the first place. In other words, they just, by them recapturing her and trying to force her to be like everyone else and to fit in with white Christian civilization and everything. It was just, it was, it was savagery what, what the, the settlers did to her. Uh, I just, I don't even want to go into it, but point is Cynthia Ann, she saw the soul, the good side of the Comanches and it was beautiful and there was value there. Um, now, 
juxtapose that against what happened to Rachel Parker, uh, Rachel Plummer Parker, rather, who was related to Cynthia Ann who, and who was also kidnapped uh, at Parker's Fort. Rachel was not assimilated into, into the tribe because part of the reason the Comanches would uh, assimilate very young, young children into the tribe is because, number one, their mind was moldable enough for them to assimilate and also, uh, you know, they just, they wanted uh, someone that uh, could bear children effectively and just be, I guess, become part of the tribe again. Uh, or, or just produce more of the tribe and be happy about doing it. Um, and so Cynthia Ann, you know, she was perfect. She was young and she molded into, uh, morphed into the Comanches and assimilated quite well. Rachel Parker, though, was quite a bit older. Um, Rachel, like I said, she was 17, she was a teenager. And they did not assimilate her because she was too old. Instead, what they did is they enslaved her, uh, both sexually and um, physically. She was forced to just live in absolute misery. Um, and she had, she experienced the evil side of the Comanches. She was raped constantly. She was, uh, I mean, I have to read you something that happens just so that I can illustrate just how bad it was for her. And I'm actually gonna read that story right now because uh, it's really crazy. So at one point, um, Cynthia Ann, before she was kidnapped into the, um, uh, into the tribe, before, before the Parker raid, she was pregnant. And uh, she'd been pregnant for four months before the raid. And so, when the Comanches kidnapped her and made her into a sex slave and manual labor slave, uh, she ended up giving birth in, uh, in that time. And I have to read to you, just to illustrate that Comanches, white people, all people, have good and bad aspects of their culture. And there were good people on both sides and there were actually there were more people on both more bad people on both sides and Rachel Plummer Parker unfortunately met many of the bad people um and so I'm just going to read what happens to her and her pregnancy and her newborn child to you <clears throat> she was also unfortunately pregnant she had been four months pregnant at the time of the Parker Raid and had borne all of this misery in advancing stages of pregnancy. In October 1836, she gave birth to her second son. She knew immediately that the child was in danger. She spoke the Comanche language well enough to, as she put it, expostulate with my mistress to advise me what to do to save my child. To no avail. Her master thought the infant too much trouble, and feeding him meant that Rachel was not able to work full time. One morning, when the baby was seven weeks old, half a dozen men came. While several of them held Rachel, one of them strangled the baby, then handed him to her. When he showed signs of life, they took him again, this time tying a rope around his neck and dragging him through prickly pear cactus and eventually dragging him behind a horse around a hundred yard circuit. My little innocent one was not only dead, but literally torn to pieces, wrote Rachel. And the reason we know this happened is because Rachel eventually was ransomed out of the tribe, uh, and uh, she, she was eventually saved out of the tribe, and she wrote down um, what happened to her. And she didn't live much longer after she uh, got back to civilization, but... Um, yeah, so when you look at the history of the Comanches, and I could go on and on and on, um, they're like all groups of people. Uh, out of, I mean, everybody knows that uh, white people were savages too. I can read you accounts of what the Texas Rangers did to uh, the Comanches and to other tribes. It's horrible. It's barbaric. And like I said at the beginning of this video, I've never read a book that has better illustrated to me the, the fact that it's gray. History's just freaking gray. And the number one character that I think illustrates that, at least in this book, that illustrates just how gray history was and just how gray humans are is Quanah Parker, 
who for the first half of his life was in the Comanche tribe. I mean, he was always in the Comanche tribe, but he was living on the plains, wild as the Comanches had for centuries. And then all of a sudden he's forced to basically um, surrender. And you see that like the common practices of the Comanches, he very likely was guilty of, including torturing people to death, raping women, doing all these horrible things. He very likely was guilty of those atrocities that the Comanches were known for uh, doing. But you see in the later portion of his life, all he did was try to save his people. That's all he tried to do in his, in his later years after he had surrendered to the US. All he did was try and feed his people, try to shelter his people, all, all, it's all he did. And you just see that like even in one man who very likely, even though it's not documented, but very likely did a lot of evil, evil things, there is still, there was still some really great good in him. And I mean, I could go on and on about Quanah Parker and how fascinating he was. And obviously I could go on and on about Cynthia Ann Parker and I could go on and on. I, I do need to mention Randall, Randall, Randall Slidell McKenzie was the guy who really uh, broke the, uh, the Indian forces. Um, and he actually developed a little bit of a friendship with Quanah Parker, oddly enough. It's one of those strange friendships in history. Um, but I did, he's just worth mentioning because uh, people always remember stupid people like Custer. Uh, whereas Randall Slidell McKenzie, he actually, he actually like, inst uh, unlike other like, unlike the Texas Rangers and un unlike many other military forces, if people surrendered, he actually took captives. He actually did not, he actually put it in to people uh, trying to rape and pillage and that sort of thing. And that's, you know, that's something. Um, but yeah, I mean like, Empire of the Summer Moon. I've maybe spoiled, I don't know, this much of it. Can you even see that? Like, there is so much history. And when you read just how the land looked, like, I live in Oklahoma. I've been through Texas, I've been to Kansas. It looked so, it was just, it was mostly just plains, completely plains, not a tree in sight. In fact, one of the ways the Comanches would often kill soldiers is the soldiers would ride out into the, into the, the plains and they would literally get lost. And the Comanches would steal their horses and then just leave them out there to wander in an ocean of just grass. And I mean, it's, I mean, it, it was, it's a book that just, uh, it rocked me to the core. I mean, obviously, I mean, I can go on and on about the buffalo and how it was horrible what people did to the buffalo. I can go on and on about, I mean, the, the Sand Creek Massacre where J.M. Chivington and I believe it was a bunch of soldiers. Just, I mean, like I said, atrocities, savagery was on both sides. J.M. Chivington was a freaking evil person who slaughtered 300, it was over 300 innocent Cheyenne people after they had just signed a peace treaty and were literally waving a flag, a white flag, and he killed them as they were sheltering under the American flag. And this guy just did it because he hated Indians. And he did it with a bunch of soldiers and it was, it was horrible. And so I just think the history that is portrayed in this book that is, that is brought forth here, it needs to not be forgotten. And S.C. Gwynn, thankfully, uh, is contributing in, in it being preserved because, I mean, it is such a wild, uh, you know, gray history of just, you know, good, evil, and everything in between. Um, I mean, I've barely talked about the Texas Rangers, except for I mentioned that, you know, they were kind of barbaric, but they were also like, I mean, you learn about the history of them and Samuel Colt and how Colt actually made his riches partly because of the Texas Rangers and how they, I mean, Samuel Colt, the whole revolver revolutionized the way the Texas Rangers and just people fought Indians because before it was just muskets that fought like a, that shot like a shot. And of course that up against Indians riding on horseback with bows and arrows was, you know, you don't have, you don't stand a chance. And for a long time people were just, they would just get slaughtered by the Comanches. 
Because number one, they didn't know how to fight on horseback, whereas the Comanches did know how to fight on horseback and always fought on horseback. Uh, and number two, uh, yeah, just a couple bullets ain't gonna save you. Um, but when the Colt came out, uh, you know, the uh, Texas Rangers would ride on horseback with their six shooters and they would be able to, you know, win and uh, fight the Comanches on their own terms, basically. Uh, it's so insane. Like, I just, it's so insane, this book. Like, you just can't even, there's not a more insane history book that I have read. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I gotta read you, like, because I mentioned uh, horses, and Comanches, they were the best uh, horsemen that there were, really. Uh, people always think of the Apaches. No, the Comanches were better. The Comanches were the only tribe that they, they fought pretty much exclusively on horseback. And the reason they won all the time for a long time is because U.S. soldiers would dismount and then try to fight them. And of course, the Comanches would just destroy them. Um, and what really changed all of that for the Texas Rangers is the Texas Rangers started to ride on horseback and fight on horseback in the way that the Comanches did. And with the Samuel Co oh, excuse me, with the Samuel Colt, the Walker Colt, they uh, were able to, and the various iterations of that later, they were able to fight the Comanches like Comanches. And so in many ways, the Comanche warfare spawned the Texas Ranger uh, warfare, uh, which is really, really cool. And there's so much history in here about that alone. Um, but uh, I have to read you how the Comanches would, their, their skill on horseback. I just have to read you this passage. Just, if you're not already interested in this book, I have to read you this so that you'll have no choice but to go out and buy this book for yourself and open your fucking mind, okay? <laughs> so, uh, this is what the Comanches could do on horseback. And this isn't even everything, okay? This is just a fraction. I could read the next, you know, three pages on what they could do on horseback, but I'll just read you one portion just to pique your interest a little bit. So, starting here, this is a uh, historical account, uh, this initial uh, first paragraph from a man named Catlin who um, had encountered the Comanches and was awed by their skill on horseback. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read. <clears throat> I am ready without hesitation to pronounce the Comanches the most extraordinary horseman I have seen yet in all my travels. He went on to write, Amongst their feats of riding, there is one that has astonished me more than anything of the kind I have ever seen or expect to see in my life. A stratagem of war, learned and practiced by every young man in the tribe, by which he is able to drop his body on the side of his horse at the instant he is passing, effectively screened from his enemy's weapons, as he lays in a horizontal position behind the body of his horse, with his heel hanging over the horse's back. In this wonderful condition, he will hang whilst his horse is at full speed, carrying with him his bow and shield and also his long lance 14 feet in length. Thus positioned, a Comanche warrior could loose 20 arrows in the time it took a soldier to load and fire one round from his musket. Each of those arrows could kill a man at 30 yards. Other observers were amazed at the Comanche technique of breaking horses. A Comanche would lasso a wild horse, then tighten the noose, choking the horse and driving it to the ground. When it seemed as if the horse was nearly dead, the choking lariat would, was slacked. The horse finally rose, trembling and, a, and in a full lather. Its captor gently stroked its nose, ears, and forehead, then put its mouth over the horse's nostrils and blew air into its nose. The Indian would then throw a thong around the now gentled horse's lower jaw, mount up, and ride away. The Comanches, as it turned out, were geniuses at anything to do with horses. Breeding, breaking, selling, and riding. They even excelled at stealing horses. Colonel Dodge wrote that a Comanche could enter a bivouac where a dozen men were sleeping, each with a horse tied to his wrist by the lariat, cut a rope within six feet of the sleeper, and get away with the horse without waking a soul. Um, holy shit. 
And that's not even a fraction. The Comanches also, uh, as young people, they would practice picking up things off the ground, even uh, being able to, uh, once they reached uh, maturity, to pick a full-grown man off the ground uh, at full speed. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's the craziest book I've ever read. Um, I, I, I cannot recommend it more. Uh, I will say that the, the, you know, the book will probably make you cry at certain points. The whole book, you'll probably just be laughing at how, like, insane everything was. That's how I am with a lot of these books. Um, and you will, I think, gain a real nuanced perspective on history. Because also what's interesting is Quanah Parker, towards the end of his life, became friends with Theodore Roosevelt, who, Theodore Roosevelt, he's one of my heroes, but he had a number of problems such as racism, and he said a whole lot of bad things about Indians, and yet he and Quanah Parker kind of became friends, and in turn, Theodore Roosevelt pushed for making the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge because of what he had probably been told by Quanah Parker uh, around the Wichita Mountains in the, in the reservation of the Comanche Indians. And so you see, like, there is so much nuance. There is good and evil inside of every person, uh, whether it be Indian, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, whatever it is, history is gray, people are gray, good and evil is, writ is written, on, written down on every man's heart. There's a different configuration for everyone. And it's also important to point out, and you'll learn about this, you'll learn just how tribes were set up. You'll learn that the Comanche tribe, we wasn't, I mean, there wasn't just like a unified force. There were five bands, at least of Comanche tribes that have different practices, but just had things in common with the other bands that made them Comanches. And so that's why when you look at history and you look at some of the atrocities committed by the US military against uh, Indians, part of that is just barbaric savagery on part of the white man. But part of that is also because Time, the times were just so confusing. You could make a peace treaty with one band of the Comanche tribe and then encounter another band of the Comanches that didn't get word of that, and then they try and kill all of you. And this happened over and over and over again. And there was also like horrible atrocities, just people were, the, the US military or just soldiers or militiamen would go out trying to fight Comanches and they would end up stumbling upon peaceful Seminoles or peaceful Cherokees or, you know, you know, just peaceful tribes. And since you couldn't really tell the difference by looking at a Comanche or a Cherokee, they would slaughter the Cherokees. They would slaughter the Cheyennes. And it's, it was such a confusing time. And you see why, from reading this book, you see why there were Indians that were racist against white people and you see why there were white people against that were racist against Indians. You can totally understand how they came to those conclusions given the amount of inf information these people encountered during that time. And so racism's not good, but you can see how people came to their conclusions, their wrong conclusions about white people in mass or Indians in mass uh, because tribes were different. Bands of different tribes were different. Uh, you know, the Comanches and the Cherokees were not the same. The Comanches were much, much more violent. In fact, the whole barbarity with regards to women, like raping them and all that stuff, that was primarily a Comanche thing. Most other tribes didn't do that. The Comanches, they really, I mean, the guy goes into, there was a lot of savagery there with regards to treatment of female captives uh, that weren't assimilated. Um, like I said, some were treated great, like Cynthia Ann Parker, you know, she was assimilated, and others were treated absolutely horribly, like, you know, Rachel Plummer Parker. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I just, I've never read a book that has just, I mean, I look around and I'm just like, so much has happened where I live and around where I live. And I will also say this book, I mean, it kind of changed my view of enviro environmentalism because I read about the environment back then and how much more life there was and how wild it was and how beautiful it was. And I look around and I just see buildings and houses in suburbia here. And I'm like, well, damn it, we've lost something. We've lost something very important and we probably can't get it back. But we, at the least, we've got to do something 
other than what we're doing to the planet right now. We've got to figure out how to live in a better way, in a less consequential way to the natural world. Because, you know, whether you believe in global warming or not, it doesn't matter. Conservation is important. Preserving nature is important. Helping there not be pollution or, or literally, we need to take better care of our environment. That's the bottom line. We have to figure out how to live. There's a balance between the old world way of living that the Comanches lived and that the other tribes lived as far as hunting and, you know, being nomadic and, you know, living off the land. There's a balance between that and what we have now. We don't have that balance. We have an extreme. Um, and so, yeah, the book will do that for you too. I've, I mean, it really is. I've, I don't think I've... I've read per perspective shattering books before, but I've never read a perspective shattering book like this on a subject I was so completely ignorant of. And so, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Empire of the Summer Moon gets like an A plus, 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 plus. You know, it's a, it's a gift from heaven type book. So ladies and gentlemen, those are my thoughts on Empire of the Summer Moon. Uh, I could obviously go on and on and on and on about all of my thoughts on the book, but that would be a much too long video. So I will just cut it here, end it. I highly recommend you read the book. Uh, if you have read the book, please leave any comments or questions or ideas you may uh, have in the comment section below of this video, and I would love to take a look at them. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, please like it and subscribe. Tell your friends about the channel, and never forget to... <laughs>